with the Father, dealing with his intentional breaking of the rules, his hard heart, and even his inability to do the things of God consciously. Sometimes we need to examine our hearts to see what we're guilty of. Because there might be things of which we're unaware. Do you remember God, or, or, or the psalmist saying, search my heart, O God. Search my heart, O God. Open my eyes and help me to see as you see. These are things that we need to be honest with God about. When you lay yourself down tonight, can I challenge you? Be honest with God. Come clean with God. Confess your sins to God. And let Him wash you that you might be whiter than snow, as David prayed. Well, I said there's a whole bunch in this, this chapter, in this prayer. I'm going to walk through seven things. So those of you who take notes, you've got to have room for seven things, okay? Seven things that we can do, seven actions that we can take, seven things that David prays that I think would be great if they become part of our prayer. The first one is this, appeal to the nature or the character of God. This psalm began how? In some ways with adoration and praise. He didn't just rush into the fact that, oops, I've goofed. He asks, he goes, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. We appeal to the nature and the character of God. David basically says, God, forgive me because of who you are. See, I'm guilty. I can't stand before God and say, I'm such a great guy. But I can stand before him and say, you are such a great God. You have revealed your character to us. We who are followers of Jesus, we know the extent of that love which sent his son to bear our sin on the cross. So we appeal to the nature and the character of God. The one whose loving kindness... <laughs> is everlasting. Those of you who were here two weeks ago, loving kindness is... Hased. Hased. That beautiful Hebrew word that we don't have a word for in English. That, that expansive, boundless mercy, grace, love of God for His people. You know, sometimes I think we're afraid to come before God because we have an inadequate or a distorted concept of His character. We perceive Him as angry and eager to destroy the wicked. Do you know that He speaks to the prophets and He says, I take no pleasure when the wicked perish. I take no pleasure when the wicked perish. That's the heart of our God. Appeal to his nature and his character. Second thing, know, name, and declare your sin. Sometimes when I lay myself down at night and I'm just going to have a quick prayer because I know I am going to fall asleep fast, I give that blanket, that sweeping, that very general prayer that maybe you've prayed to, oh God, forgive me of my sins. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But how about we take some time to say, God, I know what I have done. And we name them. God, I spoke harshly to my spouse. God, I cheated on my taxes. God, I took supplies from work. <laughs> my dad's deceased. Never speak ill of the dead. I love my dad. 
Dad worked for the Illinois Department of Transportation when Dad died. I found all kinds of state of Illinois stuff in the garage. <laughs> DOT gave the stop sign to my daughter. She got pulled over by the police because it was illegal to have a stop sign that belonged to the state in her car. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Can we name them? And it's not that God's forgiveness is contingent on that. It's that our hearts need that. We need to be honest with ourselves as well as with God. John tells us in his first little letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and this has been a verse, I'll be honest, I have held on to for decades. And it's a verse that's written to Christians for our consolation, not to the lost. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous, some translations say faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, one, He's faithful, he will do this. It's part of his nature, his character. Two, he's righteous or just to do this because the price has been paid on Golgotha at the cross. To what? Forgive us our sins. To remove that guilt and the consequence. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is as though we had never sinned to begin with. Number three. Know who you have sinned against. Now, if we were to dissect the story of David, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against an unborn child. He sinned against Uriah. He sinned against the commander of his army who he put in a spot to see that Uriah dies in battle. He sinned against his soldiers because the story begins in the time when kings go out to war, but he had stayed home. We could make a whole list of people he had sinned against, couldn't we? Have you ever read what David said in this prayer? Against you and you only have I sinned. Now be careful, that doesn't mean he didn't sin against Uriah or Bathsheba or his army or his nation, he had. It simply means this, David knows where the buck stops. All sin ultimately is committed against God. All sin, every sin, ultimately is committed against God. All of a sudden, that can make you squirm a little bit. It's bad enough that Maybe I hurt my wife with some unkind words and I can apologize to her and she can forgive me and I sleep with one eye open. <laughs> but when it becomes a case of, wait a minute, it actually is sin against God. Who have I sinned against? In my mind, it takes on even more weight. And we need to be mindful of that. Sin is committed against God, bottom line. And then David begins to ask for things. He makes some requests. He needs to have things put back right. And there's three things. But So the fourth thing on my list here is ask for cleansing. Ask for cleansing. He mentions hyssop. It's a branch, a plant, if you will, that was often used. You, you might remember in the times of Moses that he, he would put what on the hyssop? Blood. Kind of gross sounding, isn't it? And sprinkle it on the people. But why? Because the writer of Hebrews tells us why. He says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Hyssop associated with blood has to do with cleansing has to do with a sacrifice. And so you and I, we look to the cross. You know, 
Remember the old hymn? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? We used to, you know, this, this isn't in my notes and is a side point. There was a point when, when I was still in school, so this would have been back in the 70s, 80s, that some denominations were rewriting hymns to remove the word blood because blood was unacceptable in our culture. You, you, you can't offend people with blood talk. But if there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, if I remove the blood, what else do I remove? The forgiveness of sin. Satan's sneaky, isn't he? Even in our songs. So sing about the blood. Ask God to cleanse you. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Of all those things that you did, David? Yes. Of that terrible litany of sin. By the sacrifice that God makes, I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It's a beautiful picture. Forgiveness. Number five, ask for renewal. Verses eight through ten, as sometimes we sing this, don't we? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. He asks for renewal. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. It's interesting. He uses two different words. Create is make something new. Create in me a clean heart. This goes beyond wash me. It's give me a heart transplant. And again, Scripture talks about how God will remove the heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Give me a new heart. Create something new in me that has been absent before. A heart that is wholly devoted to you. And then he uses the word renew in verse 10. This is like cutting and polishing. You know, when you were a child, did you have one of those rock polishers? You know, you'd go and get kind of a rough stone. You got one? Cool, you got a rock with you? He'd give me a no. This was your chance to come up here and shine, buddy. You know, a rock polisher, and you put that rough piece of rock in there, and the thing does its job, and it comes out, and it's almost like a jewel, isn't it? You know? I can remember being a kid, and we'd, we'd go on trips down through Kentucky and Tennessee and Missouri, and, you know, the little roadside stops? You know, world's largest reptile? you know, or whatever it is that they have beside the road today. But I could also remember rocks for sale, polished rocks. They're pretty. That's the idea of renew here. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cut and polish my spirit. Trim away what shouldn't be there. And shine me up real good, God, so that my spirit is pretty in your sight. That's David's prayer. What a neat prayer. Create in me something new and renew in me something that can shine. Ask for restoration. This is the next one. Ask for restoration. Verses 11 through 15. You know, David's asked, don't cast me away. I, I can't live apart from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore. There's that word, restoration. Restore to me what? Joy of your salvation. That sense when you know you've been cleansed and the, the weight is off your shoulders and you know that all is right with you and God. You have the perfect shalom, the perfect peace of God. It's washed over. You've been restored. And then what does he say? He says, and then, 
I'll teach transgressors your ways. What's he saying? He says, I'll teach people who are where I was your ways. I'll help them know the depth of your grace. I'll help them know forgiveness. I'll teach those who are living as I lived your ways. And sinners will be converted to you. They'll love this message. They'll be drawn to your gospel. Sinners will be converted to you. I'll joyfully sing of your righteousness. Open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. How beautiful. Do you sing the glories of the forgiveness that's yours in Christ? Can you not help but speak the glory of God because He's created in you a clean heart and renewed in you a steadfast spirit? And number seven, be sincere. Be sincere. You can't fool God. He will see through the smoke screen of insincerity. Notice in this culture where sacrifices of lambs, of goats, of bulls, of birds was a constant at the temple and, well, at this point, at the tabernacle. The temple will be built a little later. That David says, you don't delight in sacrifice or I'd give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. David understands God wasn't concerned primarily with the external, but the internal. So verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Broken, shattered. A fine crystal dropped from the shelf and countless pieces upon the floor. A broken heart. A contrite spirit. Contrite, an interior repentance. Something that's not exterior, but something that goes down to the very depths of our being. And when we offer to God our brokenness and our repentance, He will not despise. He will not look down upon. He will not say, bring me more. He will say, you are mine. Coming clean before God allows me to come clean before the rest of the fellowship of God's people. How could David sing Psalm 51 in public worship? See, because the Psalms are, they're songs of praise. We, we sing some of these words. But here is David, the one that God had to speak to through Nathan the prophet, and he sings Psalm 51. How could he do that before the people of Israel? Because he had come clean with God. He had gone deep with God, and God had cleansed him. The Psalms are not in a chronological order. Psalm 32 comes after Psalm 51. Okay? Psalm 32 comes after Psalm 51. Not in the order in our Bible, but in history. This is also a psalm that David wrote. This is the end of the story. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My, vitali my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. 
My iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Don't be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they won't come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Do you hear the difference? Psalm 51, a broken and contrite spirit. He is, he's had the, the, the shade pulled back, the curtain is pulled back, and his sin is exposed, and he's honest with God. And Psalm 32, how blessed. How blessed is the forgiveness. Rejoice. Rejoice, O oh Christian. I mentioned earlier, this afternoon, tonight, when you take your time to pray, be honest with God. Go deep with Him. Come clean with Him. And He will wash you and renew you and restore you because of Christ, because of His nature and His character, for He is good. And if you're here today and you have never come to Him for that cleansing by the blood, yes, it seems so odd, but by the sacrifice of Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, we invite you as we sing this song, come to Jesus today. Would you stand as we sing?
Good morning. Wow, I'm here. I got you awake now. So, what a sermon. You get the main gist of what Bill was talking about today? Prayer. And that's the same thing we're having in our class on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. And it's really good. And I encourage a lot of people that's not coming to come to it because we have a lot of different aspects of people talking about how they pray and that stuff. And it sheds a new light in your life. I have another announcement. Uh, this is for the servers that are here today. Uh, we're having, going to have a short meeting right after church today, so would you please stick around when we get done with service so we can have a short meeting about serving communion. And uh, I'm going to ask before I go on, uh, it's been kind of a sad weekend for me and my wife. We lost, we lost a very dear friend Saturday in a uh, Thursday, I mean, in a snowmobile accident. He was killed up in Wisconsin. And it, he was a guy I went to high school with and a real good friend of our family. I would hope you'd have his family in his prayers. His name was Bob Groder. And pray for him and his family that they have comfort through God like we do when we pray for each other in our church. Thank you. Uh, you guys can go ahead and sit down. It's amazing. Bill's talking about prayer and Jesus and God. Well, I'm going to speak from Matthew 17, 5. And it says, pay attention to him. While Jesus was still speaking, a bright cloud covered the disciples and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love, who I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is one of the rare moments when God spoke himself to the disciples. They heard, Jesus, they heard Jesus, the Son of God. They followed him, but at that moment they were sidetracked. God had allowed them to see Elijah and Moses, and they were starstruck. They wanted to build monuments to the elder statements of the faith. This was a miracle, but they wanted to commemorate the unbelievable moment. God was not disrespecting his two servants, but he seemed to find fault with the disciples' thinking, thinking and actions. He shifted the spotlight back to his son and basically said, pay attention to him. Jesus was more important. He would change eternity. He would offer that Elijah and Moses no longer, so mo offer what Elijah and Moses longed for. His life would be perpetually celebrated and his name honored. Pay attention to him. He loved enough to rescue without protest. He cared enough to live the life of a human for you. He died willing to, willing to pay the price for your sin. Pay attention to him. Jesus, is an, it's easy to think of Christian leader as someone important and honorable. They should be respected, but the message that they share isn't about themselves, it's about you. Please pay attention to him.
This is the bread that represents Jesus' shredded body that he sacrificed for us. The Jews represent the blood that was shed for us so we may have eternal life. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for sacking your spice your son for us. And on that third day when he rose, to offer us the eternal life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so happy that you were able to join us today, both in person and online. I hope that you um, were, were blessed by the, the message today and, and make a point to, to have that uh, prayer. Um, it actually made me think of a song by the group Cain, and it says, on the best days, I'm a child of God. On the worst days, I'm still that child of God. So um, just remember that, even when you mess up, still a child of God. Would you please stand and sing with us? With the spirit of the Lord. 